I think we shall start on time. Uh, so it is our great honor to have uh, uh, Joe Davigi from uh, University of Cambridge. And uh, he will be speaking uh, today. And he's also his co collaborator, uh, Nakarin Lohisiri, uh, also done related work. And he will speak next Wednesday. If you are interested in today's talk, you should also stay tuned next Wednesday. And today, Joe's talk will be on the global anomalies in the standard models and beyond. And let's welcome Joe. Okay, Please. thank you, Jihun, for the, for the intro. Uh, and thanks also for the invitation to give this talk. Um, sorry, yeah, I think that's all okay. Um, and thank, thanks everyone for tuning in to listen. Uh, so as Jihun said, I'll be speaking about global anomalies in the standard models and beyond. So the motivation for this work is, is very much from high energy physics, uh, even from particle phenomenology. Um, but the, the mathematical tools that we'll use to investigate the idea of global anomalies, um, in particular ideas from Bordism, Bordism theory, uh, have been applied widely in condensed matter physics in recent years. So as well as in investigating anomalies, uh, Bordism ideas have been used in the study and the classification of symmetry protected topological phases uh, of theories uh, at low energies. So there's certainly some shared interest between particle physicists and condensed matter physicists in this subject. So here's a rough outline of the talk. I'll begin with uh, some motivation. Then I'll describe um, as best I can the connections between global anomalies, uh, what's called the eta invariant and bordism. Uh, so this will be a fairly long uh, introductory section. Then I'll talk about global anomalies in the standard models of particle physics. Uh, and this will lead to um, a discussion of an interplay between local and global anomalies um, in gauge theories with, with gauge group U2 in four dimensions, both with and without spin structure. So the motivation, uh, so as uh, most physicists know, the standard model of particle physics successfully explains uh, more or less all data from collider experiments. Um, however, there's a bunch of things that it doesn't explain going beyond collider physics. So uh, the first group of, so here's just a small list of things the standard model doesn't explain. Uh, firstly, various observational facts, mostly coming from cosmology. So there's no particle physics understanding of what dark matter is similarly for dark energy. Uh, also neutrino oscillations. Neutrinos are massless in the standard model. It's not known exactly which mechanism uh, is responsible for neutrino masses and therefore neutrino oscillations. Uh, and also how to produce the observed matter-antimatter asymmetry in the universe. Uh, and as well as these observational deficiencies of the standard model, uh, there are various theoretical or perhaps aesthetic problems. So how would you describe physics beyond the Planck scale? We should be even be asking this question. And how should we understand the two hierarchy problems uh, associated with the two super renormalizable operators in the standard model Lagrangian uh, and ideas of naturalness? So uh, what's certainly clear uh, and there's agreement amongst particle physicists is that there is ultimately a need at some point for particle physics to go beyond the standard model. However, uh, a fact that's perhaps less widely appreciated is that the standard model, uh, as it's often posed as a gauge theory, is uh, in a sense not unique. So what do I mean? I mean that the gauge group of the standard model is not uniquely fixed by what we know from experiments. So in particular, everything we know about the interactions of gauge bosons from experiment only determine the Lie algebra of the standard model gauge group uh, to be the Lie algebra of this group, SU3 times SU2 times U1. So there are, of course, many different gauge groups uh, which have this Lie algebra. And of course, we have another big constraint, which is coming from the fermion spectrum of the standard model. So we know uh, the representations of various fermions, uh, but still there are four different locally isomorphic groups, um, at least assuming G is connected, which admit all of the standard model fermion representations. Uh, and those are of this form. So SU3 times SU2 times U1, uh, up to some possible quotient by gamma n, a central discrete subgroup of SU3 times SU2 times U1, where gamma n can be either nothing, uh, Z2, Z3, or Z6. So to be concrete about how this uh, Z6 subgroup is embedded in SU3 times SU2 times U1, um, omega denotes the generator of this uh, Z6 quotient, 
um, and it corresponds to this element in SU3 times SU2 times U1. So we have uh, uh, the central order three element in SU3, the central order two element in SU2, and a phase, a U1 phase of two pi over six. Then the, the gamma three quotient will be generated by omega squared and the gamma two quotient by omega cubed. So the gauge group of the standard model could be one of these four. Uh, and the obvious question then is, could you tell the difference between these different options? So in theory, yes. Uh, so there was this nice paper from David Tong a few years ago uh, about this issue. So there are various differences between these gauge theories, uh, largely of mostly of a topological flavor. So firstly, the theta angle associated with uh, U1 hypercharge has different periodicities in these theories. Uh, there's also a different spectra of um, non-perturbative operators, so both electric and magnetic line operators. Um, so um, in David Tong's paper, the, the, the results from this, this earlier paper by Aharoni Syberg and Tachikawa were used to answer this question. So as you go from left to right here and you take a larger discrete quotient, um, I think there are fewer electric line operators and therefore more magnetic line operators. And so the important point here being that uh, the Wilson and, and Tuft line operators uh, can generically occur in all representations of the gauge group. So even though we only see fermions in a small subset of representations, uh, these non, this non-perturbative sector in principle probes all representations of G. Um, finally, if uh, you're inclined towards grand unified theories, uh, they tend to prefer the option with the Z6 quotient um, it's this option that fits inside, say, the SU5 gut and also the spin 10 gut. Um, but with current experiments, um, we're not sensitive, at least in colliders, to any of these subtle differences. Um, basically, uh, there's no effect of any of these things on correlation functions of local operators and the kind of things that are ultimately probed in observations from the Large Hadron Collider uh, and such sources. So another possibility, at least a priori, was that the four different standard model gauge groups uh, could perhaps be distinguished because they suffer from different anomalies. So the perturbative anomalies uh, cancel in all of them because the perturbative anomalies obviously only depend on the Lie algebra of the gauge group, which is the same. Uh, and we know that the regular standard model, uh, this option, um, is anomaly free, or certainly free of perturbative anomalies. But this doesn't rule out uh, the possibility of more subtle global anomalies associated with the topology of G, which is obviously different in these four cases. So this raises the question, perhaps not all four of the standard models are truly anomaly free, um, maybe in some subtle sense, and you could, in a sense, rule out certain options by consistency. So this uh, question... I have, uh, I have no a question. question. Suppose you yeah. take the one where you divide by Z6. Yes. So it admits a lot of different kinds of bundles. And I yes. wonder if it's true that, okay, if you consider one of the other groups, yes. they have a smaller set of bundles. I wonder yes. if it's true that anomaly freedom for Z6 immediately implies anomaly freedom in the other cases, simply because every bundle of one of the other yes, so groups can, comes from a bundle of Z, in the Z6 case. Yes, uh, definitely. So this is true. This would be true if you fix the fermion content such that it can be embedded in the Z6 quotient. And then you're right in that any bundle, say, of Z2 is automatically a Z6 bundle, but not the other way around. Uh, and indeed, this is the argument used um, here in this paper by Garcia, Echeverria, and Montero. So they consider the Z6 quotient, and they show that that's anomaly free by fitting it inside the SU5 gut. And then by this argument uh, that you've said that any bundle of the others uh, okay. corresponds to a bundle of the Z6 quotient allows you to deduce that the other options are also anomaly free. Okay, thanks. Okay. Uh, can I ask a so, question? So, yeah, so okay. please. Uh, so, uh, let's, can, we, can we go back? Yeah, here. Uh, I wonder if it's possible to detect the difference between these theories just by increasing the energy scale of the collider. How exactly? For example, suppose suppose there's let's just look at the simpler case where there's only SU two and the U one, no SU three. 
then the, the say my purpose is just to distinguish SU2, mm. SU1, and U2. Mm. Then shouldn't there be a difference where in, in the U2 case, you will only have a matter field that is, when, when it has charge one on the U1, it necessarily has a fundamental representation on the SU2. But for U, SU2 cross U1, you can have a matter content that is charge one, but singlet on the SU2, and another matter that is fundamental on the SU2, but charge neutral on the U1, then they have different yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, so I understand the question. So uh, certainly the fermions that we know exist currently uh, can't tell the difference because those are equally good representations of U2 as they are representations of SU2 times U1. Um, what you're suggesting is, is certainly the case if uh, by cranking up the energy of a collider, you could discover additional fermions uh, and those fermions were in representations that couldn't be representations of U2 because they didn't obey this relation between isospin and U1 charge, then you could rule out U2. Mm -hmm. uh, it's perhaps yeah. worth mentioning the following. Um, fermions that would be relevant here can't be arbitrarily heavy because once, yes. once you get a, a, to the energies at which the electroweak gauge symmetry is restored, any fermions more massive than that can't contribute anomalies because they have G invariant bare masses. So, well, we probably haven't quite ruled out the existence of, fermi of new fermions that are relevant, but we're close. Possibly you could have a scenario where you had fermions gauged under the SU3, um, which don't couple to the Higgs being massive, but then you have other problems from having strongly coupled massive states, which will be produced very abundantly at the LHC. Well, long before the LHC, uh, if you really had particles in exotic quantum numbers of SU3, they'd have showed up at much lower energies. Okay, good. Thank well, you. Remember, we've discovered quarks. Up to, well, uh, if you want to hide a strongly interacting particle, you have to give it a large bare mass, hmm. which might violate the electroweak symmetry, in which case it could contribute anomalies. In the case you mentioned that it doesn't have electroweak quantum numbers, it would really have a, to be hidden from, never mind modern experiments, but from experiments of 30 or 40 years ago, it would have to have a, a large bare mass, in which case it doesn't have an anomaly. Yeah, okay. Um, okay, very nice. Uh, this leads, leads on to the next point in, in a sense. So, um, I mentioned this paper by Montero and Garcia Echeverria from a few years ago. So um, this paper, I should say, really got us interested in this question in the first place. And most of what I'll say today is in a sense inspired by reading this paper. So uh, they settled the question of anomaly freedom of the standard models by fitting it inside a gut. Um, in our paper, so firstly this paper with Nakar and Lohit Ziri, who Juven has mentioned, and also Ben Grapeos, um, we computed global anomalies in the standard models directly. So by directly computing the relevant Buddhism groups for uh, gauge groups of this form, so SU3 times SU2 times U1, quotiented by one of these discrete groups. Um, so this, so uh, what we found was uh, that there is at most uh, one type of global anomaly, which is uh, the SU2 anomaly. Um, so as, as we're aware, cancelling this anomaly requires an even number of fermions uh, with isospin under SG2 of the form 2R plus a half, where R is an integer. So isospin half, five halves, nine halves, etc. And the way in which this result is an extension of um, this first result is uh, precisely the way the, the, the problem we were just discussing. So this result would hold if the standard model were extended by arbitrary uh, BSM fermion fields. Um, we've had a nice phenomenological discussion of whether that's really likely to happen. Uh, but certainly if it does happen, if there were additional fermions that we haven't discovered yet for some reason, um, with the same standard model gauge group, then we know from this result that uh, if the perturbative anomalies cancel, then the only possible global anomaly is uh, Witten's SU2 anomaly. Uh, interestingly, um, there is at most the Witten SU2 anomaly. So 
In particular, there are no global anomalies at all in two of these four standard models. So in the case where the quotient is by gamma two or by gamma six, and we can understand this as being due to an interplay between the local and global anomalies. So this is something that Nakrin and I then explored further in this follow-up paper. Um, so we'll just, I'll discuss this in the late last section of this talk, uh, which would also involve a discussion of a more subtle version of this story where the U, a U2 gauge theory is defined without a spin structure. Uh, so at this point, um, we detach slightly from the standard model motivation because uh, the, the fermion content of the standard model can't actually be realized in this theory without a spin structure. Um, but hopefully it's an interesting story in itself. Okay, are there any more questions at, at this point? Okay, we'll carry on. Um, so now I'll discuss the connection between global anomalies uh, and boredism, which proceeds via the eta invariant. Uh, so firstly, let's review, um, if you like, what geometric in ingredients we need to define a chiral gauge theory in four dimensions. So as a particle physicist, I'll, I'll basically always be in four dimensions. So we have a four manifold sigma, which is space time, which we'll take to be Euclidean. Then we need the following structures. So we need some form of spin structure on sigma to define fermion fields. And we need a principal G bundle over sigma to define gauge fields. So this is equivalent to saying that space time sigma should be equipped with some map F from space time into the classifying space of G, uh, which classifies principal bundles, principal G bundles. Finally, we need, a well we need there to be a well-defined Dirac operator, which we could denote by ID slash, um, which we can think of from the physics point of view as coupling the fermions to the gauge fields via a Lagrangian, uh, the standard thing. So sidebar ID slash psi. And we'd like to assume that the theory should be defined on all four manifolds that emit these structures. Now, I assume that space time is orientable now, there's a good reason for doing so in particle physics, which is that the standard model uh, is known to break CP. Therefore, it violates also time reversal symmetry. Um, so we should assume that space time is orientable in order to define uh, a time reversal violating theory like the standard model. Uh, but note that in many condensed matter systems um, where you do a similar analysis, you might have time reversal symmetry. And in that case, you have the option of also defining your system on non-orientable manifolds. And you could use, a, say, a variant of a spin structure, like a pin plus or pin minus structure, depending on the sign of T squared on fermions. So I'll also need the concept of boredism, so I'll introduce this briefly. Uh, so boredism for this talk will mean an equivalence relation between smooth, compact, closed manifolds of a certain dimension, say D, um, with these structures. So with, let's say, for sake of argument, with the spin structure, and with a map to BG. So we say that two different D manifolds, Y0 and Y1, are bordant or equivalent under this bordism relation. Uh, if there exists a manifold in one dimension higher, call it X, um, with any of the structures, so the spin structure and the map to BG extended over X, such that the boundary of X is the disjoint union of Y0 and Y1 with one of their orientations reversed. So Y0, for example, could have disconnected components. Um, and the statement that this Y0 is bordant to this Y1 just means that there exists this bordism um, in one dimension higher called X with the structures extended uh, in this way. So bordism is an equivalence relation between these D manifolds. Uh, so it partitions the, the set of such D manifolds uh, into equivalence classes under the bordism relation. And these form an abelian group uh, undertaking the disjoint union of the D manifolds. So this abelian group is denoted by omega subscript D, where D denotes the dimension, uh, superscript spin denotes the spin structure uh, of BG, which means of manifolds equipped with maps to BG. Uh, so to make clear uh, an important point, the zero element in this abelian group therefore contains all D manifolds of this kind, which are boundaries of D plus one manifolds uh, with the spin structure and maps to BG extended to the D plus one manifold. So suppose sigma is our four dimensional space time, um, then this will be in the trivial bordism class if it's bordant to nothing, say a point, 
um, which is the same as saying it's the boundary of such a five manifold. Uh, so we'll need this concept of borderism shortly. So now let's return uh, to the problem of uh, anomalies and understanding anomalies. So for this talk, anomalies will refer to those arising from a functional partition function of this form. So uh, denote the object Z subscript psi, just to denote a fermionic partition function. And this will be a function of some background fields. In particular, A will be a background gauge field, um, and C will be the space time on which we define a theory, which we can imagine is also equipped with a background metric. Sorry. We won't integrate over the gauge field in this definition. Uh, we just integrate over the fermions with the action I described. Um, and formally, this defines a kind of a uh, determinant of the Dirac operator. So we say the theory is non anomalous if this four dimensional partition function is a genuine uh, complex valued function on, of its arguments, so on the space of background data. So importantly for the gauge field, this means on the space of gauge fields, modulo gauge transformations. So in other words, if I go around uh, an orbit under a gauge transformation, the partition function shouldn't change um, if it's to be well-defined. Uh, on the other hand, the theory will be anomalous. Uh, for an anomalous theory, this partition function is at best, so the, the determinant of the Dirac operator is at best a section of a bundle over the space of background data. Now, this is formally the determinant line bundle, but we won't really need uh, to be uh, so formal in the rest of this talk. But the basic idea uh, we should think of is if we go around an orbit under a gauge transformation, then uh, the phase of the partition function might change, uh, which corresponds to moving in the fiber of this bundle. So it's helpful, it can be helpful to divide the analysis into two types of anomaly, so local anomalies and global anomalies, which might also be called perturbative and non-perturbative anomalies, as far as I'll use the terms. So a local anomaly is when the partition function isn't constant under a gauge transformation of the background field, uh, even for a gauge transformation infinitesimally close to the identity. So these uh, the original and these anomaly diagrams, so one loop triangle diagram. A global anomaly uh, might best be defined simply as uh, any anomaly that's not a local anomaly. So the canonical example of a global anomaly uh, due to Witten is um, one I've already mentioned. So it's the SU2 anomaly, so a 4D SU2 gauge theory uh, for sake of argument with one fermion doublet. So ISO spin half uh, has this anomaly. So under a particular SU2 gauge transformation by SU2 matrix U of X, the partition function uh, flips sign. Um, so in other words, it's not well defined on the space of SU2 gauge fields modulo SU2 gauge transformations. And it's for a particular U of X in a non-trivial homotopy class of SU2. So corresponding to the Z2, but the non-trivial class in this Z2. Now you can see this uh, anomaly in a different way, which is perhaps simpler. Um, which I will in fact discuss later on when I talk about this U2 uh, interplay business, um, which is that in the background of a single instanton, a single SU2 instanton, you can see the fermionic partition function flip sign uh, for a single fermion under uh, minus the action of minus one to the F, uh, which is equivalent to the central element of SU2, which is a gauge transformation, hence the anomaly. So uh, some, some facts about global anomalies, uh, just to emphasize, they can't be seen perturbatively and they're not determined just by the Lie algebra of G, um, hence a reason why we might call them global. Um, also in this sense, we saw the gauge transformation wasn't deformable to the identity. So in that sense also, this is a global anomaly. Uh, and typically they can be finite order anomalies, which just means they'll be they can be valued in, in some discrete group like Z2. Um, so, if I add a second fermion of the same kind, then the theory becomes non-anomalous. And such a fact isn't true for local anomalies of this kind. Uh, excuse me, can I ask you a quick question? Yes, please. Um, about the Witten anomaly, as far as I understood, it's about uh, one generation of chiral fermions once you have uh, 
two, I mean, even generation of chiral fermions, then it's, uh, it's fine. So I think a standard model doesn't have the written anomaly because it has uh, even number of chiral fermions. Yeah, yeah, that's true. So, um, yeah, this point that this, this anomaly is Z2-valued means exactly as you say, if you have an even number of the anomalous fermions, then uh, the anomaly goes. Um, and that's exactly the case for the standard model, as you say. So that's one example of a global anomaly. Um, how can we understand or study global anomalies systematically um, if they can't be seen perturbatively? So to do so, we need a better understanding of uh, the object that we've called this fermionic partition function. So um, the first observation is a simple one, which is if we split the partition function into a modulus and an argument, in fact, the modulus of the partition function is necessarily anomaly free. So we can track down the anomaly, uh, the possible anomaly can only enter via the phase of the partition function. So you might then uh, ask a naive question and wonder whether you can simply define uh, an anomaly free theory by specifying that the partition function should be set equal to its modulus. Um, and this is not a very good idea because the modulus is not going to be smooth in its argument. So for That's the same reason that the modulus Sorry, that was very loud on my computer. The non-smoothness isn't the only problem. Physically, you want the variation of the action with respect to A to be the expectation value of the current operator. Mm. And that will not be true if you replace Z by its absolute value. Yeah, I thought that also followed from it not being smooth in A. Then you can't take derivatives. Well, suppose, it were, you're, suppose you're in a situation where z is never zero, then the absolute value would in fact be smooth, but it would still be physically wrong because its variation with respect to a would not be the current expectation value. Okay, thank you. So I guess the same, the same thing would be true for its dependence on the background metric and the stress tensor correlation function? Yes. Okay. Um, so, uh, so this is not an option. Um, so we actually need to understand the, the phase of the partition function. Uh, and this can be understood using the idea of anomaly inflow. So begin with the perturbative, a perturbative version of anomaly inflow, which will likely be quite familiar. Uh, so the story goes like this. So suppose our four dimensional space time sigma is the boundary of a five manifold X such that the spin structure and the map to BG extend to the five manifold X. Then you can reproduce any perturbative anomaly uh, on sigma um, by introducing a 5D classical Chern Simons term in this manifold X. So in other words, uh, I can make a world of, uh, a well posed definition of my four dimensional partition function by just taking the anomaly free part of the, the 4D theory. So the modulus of Zeb psi and then reproduce the any possible chiral uh, perturbative anomaly by coupling to a Chern Simons term in this five dimensional bulk. So I5 is uh, the Chern Simons form uh, in degree five. Uh, so it's such that its exterior derivative, at least locally, is the gauge invariant anomaly polynomial, uh, which I'll call phi six. So this anomaly polynomial is, is defined to be this uh, polynomial in the field strength F and the Riemann tensor R. So this A hat denotes something called the Dirac genus, uh, which we can just think of as a polynomial in R. Uh, so this notation just means take the sixth form pieces uh, that you get when you expand this out. So this is the perturbative story, which is well known. And we can view this in a different way just by taking this exponential and putting it on the left hand side. Uh, mathematically, this is exactly the same statement, but it says that any perturbative anomaly in the 4D theory can be matched or cancelled by coupling to a 5D bulk Chern Simons term. Uh, and that will give a, a well-defined theory on the right hand side where we just have this modulus. So how does um, this perturbative story generalize to the non-perturbative case? Um, so this recent paper from last year by Ed Witten and Yonakura um, was about this very problem. Uh, so the, non the appropriate non-perturbative generalization of this story uh, in the same scenario, so we're still in the case where sigma is the boundary of a five manifold. 
Uh, so the rough story is that the Chern Simons coupling should be replaced with the exponential of something called the eta invariant, evaluated on the five manifold X. So again, the definition of our four dimensional theory of function of a background gauge field on sigma um, is given by the modulus times by an exponential of this eta invariant on X. So the eta invariant is something that was introduced by Atiyah, Patodi and Singer uh, when they wrote down their index theorem for manifolds with boundary. Uh, and we can think of it as basically the sum over the signs of the eigenvalues of the Dirac operator. And of course, this has to be regularized in some way. So in this definition here, this exponential factor is just a, a, a possible regularization. Um, and the kind of real content here is that it's the sum of the signs of the eigenvalues of the Dirac operator. Um, so a famous paper by Diane Freed, um, which has been used recently in physics literature quite a bit, uh, says that a definition such as this, um, well, I'm certainly paraphrasing because I've neglected most of the important technical facts to do with boundary conditions, um, but they say that such a definition is, is smooth uh, in the background data, so in the background gauge field and the background metric, if, if we suppose there's a background metric. So uh, this object certainly provides a suitable, uh, at least in the sense of being smooth, um, object for studying both local and global anomalies, um, as we'll see uh, a bit more. So if you're doing four dimensional physics and you're saying this is a, a four dimensional uh, theory, then this is a slightly puzzling definition because it seems to depend on the choice of a five manifold. And uh, if certainly if you're thinking about genuine particle physics and the standard model, we have no reason to suppose that there is, uh, that we live on the boundary of such a five manifold. So in this slide, we'll make a very strong assumption and we'll say that by a local 4D theory, we mean uh, we want the four dimensional theory to be independent of the choice of this five dimensional bulk X. So I could write down this definition of the partition function using a particular five dimensional manifold X, or I could choose a different one, X prime, evaluate this expression and I should get the same answer. So that requires that these two phases uh, should be equal. So the exponential of the eta invariant on X bar, X prime should e equal the exponential of the eta invariant on X. Uh, now there's a gluing property of the eta invariant, uh, which basically means, so I can take one of these to the other side um, and then introduce, well, cancel back the, the minus sign that I introduced by flipping the orientation of say X, if I've brought X over here. And then I can glue together X and X bar along their boundary. Um, and the eta invariant obeys a gluing property, uh, which means that uh, the result of doing that will just be the exponential of the eta invariant on this closed five manifold X bar, which I got by gluing together X and X prime with its orientation reversed. So our condition uh, that the partition function uh, is the same whether I use uh, X or X prime um, boils down to requiring that the exponential of the eta invariant on this closed five manifold X should be one. Uh, and moreover, uh, this must hold for any closed five manifold X bar uh, that admits again, an extension of the spin structure and the map to BG. And this condition, which I've said is a, in a sense a 4D locality condition, will have very strong implications uh, for anomalies, as we will see. So what's the connection uh, to anomalies, but also to Bordism? So uh, to understand the connection, we should consider the atiyah patodi singer index theorem. Uh, and I'll say what this means. So this is for, in this, in that, now we're passing to a six manifold Y Who's, so we suppose there's a six manifold Y uh, whose boundary is the closed five manifold X bar introduced in the previous slide. So the atiyah patodi singer index theorem is, is like a generalization of the atiyah singer index theorem. So it gives you an expression for the index of the Dirac operator, in this case on the six manifold, in terms of an integral of a local anomaly polynomial density, phi six over Y. But when Y has a boundary, uh, those two things aren't quite equal. There's this boundary correction. And APS proved that that boundary correction is uh, what they call the eta invariant on X bar. So uh, why am I saying this? So this APS index theorem tells us some important things uh, regarding our problem. 
So firstly, uh, if ever this five closed five manifold is a boundary, um, then the APS index theorem holds. And because the index is necessarily an integer, uh, what that means is that the eta invariant is equal to the integral of this anomaly polynomial up to an integer, which can be written in terms of the chern simons form we saw before. So this is a way of understanding uh, that the eta invariant captures all of the perturbative anomalies uh, that we saw with the perturbative version of the anomaly inflow earlier. Secondly, we can also understand uh, that when the anomaly polynomial phi six vanishes, that tells us that eta is an integer because again, the index is an integer. So uh, when the anomaly polynomial vanishes, then eta is an, is an integer for all closed five manifolds, which are boundaries of six manifolds. In other words, five manifolds in the trivial Bordism class, uh, which I introduced previously. So this uh, means that the eta invariant is a Cobordism invariant in this, in, under these circumstances, uh, because it means that it's exponential, is eta is an integer, so this is just one for all closed uh, x bar, um, if all, all closed x bar are in the trivial Bordism class, in other words, if this Bordism group is zero, that's the first conclusion. But the more general statement um, is that the exponential of eta is a cobordism invariant when phi six vanishes, because I can take any um, any closed five manifold x bar, suppose it's in a non-trivial bordism class, and if I take the disjoint union of the boundary, um, then this statement means that x of eta is unchanged. So it's constant on bordism classes. Uh, can I ask one question? Uh, yeah. So, uh, as far as I, I have understood, as, as is shown by Yonekura in one of his papers uh, appendix, uh, the form of a partition form you just took, just with uh, only the eta invariant without a chan Simons form, uh, will not be invariant under the parallel transport along the uh, parameter space. Therefore, he, he said that he, you need to add, in addition to the eta invariant, exponentially eta, eta invariant, you also have to uh, include chan Simon's form or anomaly polynomial to cancel that uh, non-invariance. Um, so I'm yeah. a little bit um, Yeah, I have also uh, a while ago read that appendix and I remember what you're saying. Yeah. Um, however, upon more recently reading um, the paper by Yonakura with uh, Witten, um, I was convinced that this definition involving just the eta invariant is an appropriate definition of the partition function. Well, they, they also have a section later on saying that uh, eventually they also consider that possibility, also including John Simon's action, in addition to the exponential eta invariant. Maybe okay. I can speak about that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't have a good answer for that question. Um, I don't know if anyone else has anything to add there. Uh, it's possible there are various ways of um, writing down an appropriate formula which has all the desired properties for your for your partition function depending on conventions of what you call eta and what you call the anomaly polynomial that might in fact be equivalent um, okay but yeah thanks that's worth looking into so um yeah, we'll, we'll take this simpler version of the story uh, for now, uh, where this is an appropriate definition of the phase, which we believe includes both the perturbative and the non-perturbative contributions. Uh, so where was I? Okay, so uh, now we can get towards the criterion for local anomalies. Uh, so recall from a few slides previous uh, that we saw that the theory is local, uh, by which we really meant uh, independent of the 5D bulk, when the exponential of the eta invariant is trivial on all closed five manifolds, uh, which we called X bar. So I said this has strong implications and we can basically see here that it implies the theory must be anomaly free. Um, so just if you consider manifolds in the trivial Bordism class, uh, this, this condition uh, requires that the anomaly polynomial vanishes. So there are no perturbative anomalies. Now, in that case, uh, as we know, there may still be global anomalies uh, that you could see on the non-zero Bordism classes. Uh, and in general, this is a very difficult problem to answer, even if you can compute the Bordism group, because you'd have to compute the 
exponentiated eater invariant on suitable generators of the fifth Borderism group in this case, um, which uh, I don't really know how to do in many examples. But what's certainly true, uh, and this is a very strong condition, in a sense too strong, is that if uh, the fifth Borderism group vanishes, in other words, all closed five manifolds X bar are boundaries, uh, then we immediately have um, that this relation will hold uh, from what we saw in the previous slide. So uh, we'll take this condition as a, a rather strong criterion for there being no global anomaly. Um, and you can see, uh, you can connect this with a more traditional understanding of global anomalies involving a mapping torus, because this very condition, so the, the, the phase given by the eta invariant um, also gives you the phase acquired under an anomalous transformation. Uh, so in particular, if X bar were taken to be our four manifold sigma times by say S1, so a cylinder, uh, then this five manifold provides a mapping torus and this phase factor is precisely the phase accrued by our definition of the partition function upon going once around this mapping torus. Uh, so this is in a sense a big generalization of that mapping torus argument because X bar doesn't have to be um, M times S1 or certainly doesn't have to be S4 times S1. It's, it's an, any closed five manifold. So this will be our condition. So uh, I should say there's important caveats. So one important caveat is that the whole analysis presented required uh, that this four manifold, so space time, was the boundary of a five manifold, uh, just to write down this formula, this non-perturbative anomaly inflow formula. Uh, so that's not generally going to be true. Uh, in particular, omega four spin uh, is of a point is non-zero. Um, in fact, it, it's Z uh, with the generator being so-called K three surface. So what that means is that there's a spin, there's a spin four manifold uh, called K3, uh, which can't be written as the boundary of a five manifold with the spin structure extended. So this prescription for writing down a partition function can't be used on such space times. But nonetheless, the theory can be uh, consistently defined on such manifolds, um, essentially by ass assigning arbitrary theta angles to each generator in omega four. So this is something that's been known in string theory, uh, and I won't discuss this, this subtlety. Um, but you have this kind of trade-off that you have to introduce these arbitrary theta angles. But once you do so, then the theory is well defined. Um, a second caveat. So uh, what if space-time sigma itself uh, has a boundary? So sigma is not even a closed manifold. Um, then I have nothing to say about how this story would generalize, but this is potentially a very interesting question. Um, uh, are there any questions at this stage before I go on to the next part? Okay, so global anomalies in the standard model. So we have this criterion that we know there will be no global anomalies if a Borderism group like this vanishes uh, for any four dimensional gauge theory with gauge group G. Um, so how can we compute such a borders and groups, say where G is SU3 times SU2 times U1? Uh, so really these computations of these borders and groups are in a sense standard calculations in algebraic topology. So uh, there's not anything especially interesting uh, in a research sense that we've done here. Um, so we use a particular tool to calculate these borders and groups, which is a spectral sequence, uh, in particular, the Atiyah Hertzberg spectral sequence. Um, so in this talk, I won't discuss the kind of mechanics of how this works, but we'll treat it as something of a black box uh, and basically say what ingredients you need to put into the spectral sequence and what it will calculate for you. So this is kind of summarizing on one slide everything I'll say about this spectral sequence, which is our main method. So we can think of a spectral sequence as a much more powerful generalization of exact sequences uh, to compute various things in algebraic topology. So, uh, for example, the Sir uh, spectral sequence, which was the first introduced, allows you to compute uh, homology and cohomology groups of vibrations. Now, the Atiyah Hertzberg spectral sequence is, in a sense, uh, kind of next level of the Sir spectral sequence in that it doesn't compute homology, but so called generalized homology groups of a vibration. Um, and Baldism is an example of, of generalized homology. So of a vibration X uh, with base, some base B and some fiber F. 
So the rough idea will be if we know things about F and about B, then we feed them into the spectral sequence and we can compute uh, what we want um, for the bundle. So in our case, uh, for most examples, it will be enough to consider a trivial vibration of just a point fibered over BG, the classifying space of G. And in that case, the inputs to the atia hertzberg spectral sequence are the following. So this rather unwieldy formula. So in words, this just means the homology groups of BG uh, valued in so, some coefficients, uh, where the coefficients are themselves uh, the bordism groups of a point. Um, preserving a spin structure. So if there's no torsion, then this thing splits up into a tensor product of two things, just the integral homology of BG, which is our first input, uh, and the spin borders and groups of a point, which is our second input. So for the first input, uh, the homology of BG, we can basically build up, um, sorry for the typo here, we can build up the homology of BG from simpler spaces so say where G is SU3 times SU2 times U1 is a direct product, we use the fact that the classifying space of a product is the product of the classifying spaces. And then we can use a Kunath theorem on homology uh, to compute these homology groups of B of a product. So the kind of building blocks that go into that are then, you know, that B of U1 say, you know what that is, that's CP infinity. So the homology of that is just Z in every even degree and uh, vanishes in every odd degree or B of SU2 is HP infinity, so projective space over quaternions, um, and the homology of that is Z in every degree, which is a multiple of four uh, and zero otherwise. So you can, you can imagine how you can build up the homology of these things with the Kunath theorem. Then the second input is the spin borders and groups of a point, and, and these things are known since the 1960s uh, by mathematicians. So I've just written out the first few spin borders and groups of a point in low degrees. So just to point out a few, so this uh, Z in omega-4 corresponds to this K3 surface that we mentioned. Um, and for example, this Z2 in omega-1 corresponds to different spin structures you can put on closed one manifolds, i.e. circles. Uh, and you see there's a non-trivial class, meaning that one of those spin structures, um, presumably the anti-periodic boundary conditions, can't be filled in to a disk uh, whose boundary is that circle. So these are the inputs uh, to the spectral sequence. So then we, we did various computations. Uh, so we computed these spin borders and groups uh, for the four different standard model gauge groups in degrees naught up to five. So the fifth column is the one that's telling us about global anomalies in 4D series with these gauge groups. So we get a lot of Zs and Z2s, um, and there's a lot of structure in this table so you will notice that the first two columns are always the same for the different G. And that's basically happening because they're only sensitive to the spin structure uh, because there's no, there's no um, topologically non-trivial uh, G bundles, I guess, in these low, lowest degrees. So it just, it's just conditions on spin structure. Um, also a slightly intriguing fact from the physics point of view is that these omega groups are mostly boring in odd dimensions. So they vanish in dimension three. In dimension one, this is just the thing I mentioned about spin structures on a circle. So there's not much going on there. And in dimension five, uh, we have some zeros and at most some Z2s, which will be interesting. Uh, but you should compare this to the scenario for local anomalies, um, whereby Chern Simon's forms vanish in um, the even degrees, not the odd ones. So it's in a sense, the opposite situation. So for a theory in odd dimensions, um, you don't have local anomalies, but the global anomalies which are probed by omega even uh, are potentially more interesting. So in the case of omega-5, we find at most Z2. So this is the conclusion I mentioned at the beginning, which is that there are no new global anomalies in the standard models uh, beyond uh, potentially the Witten anomaly associated with the electroweak SU2 factor in G. So um, after, after our work, uh, Zhe and Wan and Juven Wang um, published this paper on the archive where they produce um, Computa computations of similar groups uh, using the Adam spectral sequence rather than the Atiyah Hertzberg spectral sequence. Uh, and broadly, there's uh, agreement between these results. 
Now, the atom sequence used by JN and Juven is, in a sense, much more powerful. So uh, these two groups here, um, we were unable to determine um, in the sense that they were ambiguous up to this group extension problem using our method. Um, but these results were filled in uh, in this paper, which came on the archive a week or so after our one. Uh, so the results here, I think, were this, this one should be just Z times Z2, and this one should be just Z4. Okay, um, I think I had some, a slide just of some results of global anomalies we'd produced in various BSM theories. Um, so basically now just look at the final column. So we looked at theories with Z primes, a Patti Salam theory and so-called trinification models. And the upshot is we either get zeros or we get some Z twos, which you can trace back to being um, Witten anomalies for SU2 factors in the gauge group. So, there's an important lesson for model builders, which is, uh, I guess, an, an encouraging one, uh, which is that global anomalies seem to be rather rare in BSM. So this is perhaps some reassurance that uh, as long as your BSM theory is free of local anomalies, you're unlikely to run into problems with global anomalies, um, provided you think about the SU2 condition. Okay, so moving into the last part of the talk, I want to focus on these two zeros. So it's more intriguing that we have zeros here than these Z2s because we were expecting Z2s uh, because of our knowledge of the SU2 anomaly. So in these two cases of these gauge groups there can be no global anomalies at all. So the question is what's happened to the SU2 anomaly? So to do so let's uh, review the SU2. We have to first review the SU2 anomaly in a bit more detail than we did before. So as a recap, uh, suppose we have a single isospin J fermion coupled to an SU2 background F, then the Atiyah Singer index theorem tells you that the index, which is the difference between uh, the number of fermion zero modes with positive and negative chirality, is given by an integral of trace F wedge F. And this basically just gives you the instanton number P1 of F, or the first Pontryagin number of the SU2 bundle, uh, times by some representation theory dependent factor, which just comes from tracing over the SU2 matrices here. Uh, and I've called this TJ, which is sometimes called the Dinkin index. And this is given by two thirds J, J plus one times TJ plus one. Now, uh, this index um, is congruent to the sum of the numbers of zero modes, mod two. Um, so at least if P1 is odd, then the number of fermion zero modes in this background is equal to Tj uh, mod two. So, um, okay. So then the next point is that if the number of zero modes is odd, then the partition function will change sign under transformation minus one to the F, which counts the number of fermion zero modes. But the crucial point here is that minus one to the F is actually equivalent to the gauge transformation um, by minus one in SU2, uh, acting on our fermion doublet. So if the partition function flips sign under minus one to the F, then it flips sign under an SU2 gauge transformation, and that shouldn't happen. In other words, SU2 is anomalous. So uh, the partition function changes by this overall phase, um, which depends on the SU2 representation. Now, uh, you can check that this factor, T of J, is in fact an odd number. So this is always an integer, and it's an odd number if and only if the isospin is 2R plus a half. So what that means is that only these isospins can contribute to a possible minus sign here. Um, and that indeed the anomaly will cancel if and only if there's an even number of fermions with these isospins. Okay, so after that very brief review, um, why are there no global anomalies in these two standard models when they contain this SU2 subgroup? Um, so what's happened to the global anomaly? So from here on, we can forget the SU3 factor in the standard model gauge group and focus just on the difference between SU2 times U1 and SU2 times U1 quotiented by the gamma two, uh, which remember corresponded to the central element in U2 and U1. So this defines U2. So why is this borders in group zero? Uh, and the answer will be that the SU2 global anomaly is traded for a local anomaly uh, in a U1 transformation once you take this quotient, which you can think of as linking SU2 and U1. 
So um, we can understand this statement in three ways um, in the next three slides. Uh, before we do so, we need very briefly some U2 representation theory. So U2 irreps are labelled by irreps of SU2, which themselves are labelled by an isospin J, and a U1 charge Q, but there's a relation in U2 between Q and J, namely uh, in certain units for the gauge couplings, uh, Q should be equal to 2J mod 2. So in other words, if J is an integer, then Q is even, and if J is half integral, then Q is an odd number. And we could call this an isospin charge relation. So there's a more general UN statement, uh, which I've written here, but I'll, I'll skip on. So the first way to see this is the quick way, uh, which doesn't tell you much from a physics perspective. But if you just look at the coefficient for the mixed triangle anomaly, so this is in a diagram involving uh, two SU2 currents and one U1 current uh, as external legs, then uh, that mixed anomaly coefficient basically goes um, like this factor. So sum over I sub spins, and we have the index T, T of J, which comes from tracing over the SU2 matrices, times the sum of the charges. So QJ alpha just denotes some set of charges under the U1 of fermions with isospin J. So um, this is the coefficient of the mixed anomaly, uh, which is zero just by a perturbative anomaly cancellation. Now, as we saw uh, just previously, these uh, factors T of J are only odd for these isospins. These isospins are all half integer. So for those isospins, the charges are odd necessarily. They have to be odd. That's not true if the gauge group were SU2 times U1. So with this quick way, that's where the difference is coming in uh, between U2 and SU2 times U1. So using these two results, uh, we can reduce this equation mod 2 and only the contributions from these representations with J being 2R plus a half uh, survive mod 2. So only those contributions can be odd numbers, basically. So then this condition just becomes that the sum of 1 over all of those reps is 0. Uh, in other words, this is precisely the condition for the original Witten global anomaly in SU2 to vanish. So this is a quick way to see it, but this just looks like a coincidence. Uh, so we can understand this uh, the physics way. So in U2, uh, the defini definition of U2 obviously means that the element minus 1, 1 in SU2 times U1 is equivalent to the identity and just a phase of minus 1 in U2. So in other words, our SU2 gauge transformation by minus one is actually the same thing in U2 as a local U1 transformation by e to the i pi. So now we can compute how we expect the partition function to change under just a U1 gauge transformation by e to the i theta, where we'll set theta to pi. So this is just the standard, uh, we can think of this as just coming from the non-invariance of uh, the fermion path integral measure. So for example, using Fujikawa's method for studying how the, the fermion measure changes. So you get precisely these terms. So the partition function changes by a phase, um, which involves the same integral we saw. So the integral of trace of F wedge F plus a gravitational piece uh, that vanishes on S4. Um, so we get precisely the same factor of P1 and T of J, but now with an overall uh, prefactor, which includes the charge Q and the angle theta. So if theta is pi and the instanton number is odd, which recall was the, was the, was the place where you saw the Witten anomaly, was only for odd instanton numbers, um, then this phase gives you an overall possible minus sign, a factor of minus 1 to the Q times Tj. So this is just under a U1 gauge transformation. So this better equal ZA. And we can clearly see that the theory is non-anomalous then if there's an even number of fermions with these isospins, because again, exactly the same argument uh, for those fermions, we know that the charges Q are necessarily odd numbers. Uh, oh, so can, I, can I ask a question? Yes, please. So your equation 26 seems to be indicating that uh, topologically non-trivial transformation in the case of uh, Z2, of meaning mod with Z2, is equivalent to some local transformations. So my question is, uh, does U2 have a non-trivial fourth homotopic group or actually it is a trivial? 
Well, I think it's uh, non-trivial. Uh, Pi 4 of U2, I believe, is also Z2. Okay, I see. So this was the reason why I introduced not the homotopy version of understanding the SU2 anomaly, but this this version where you look in a background of instanton number one uh, and you look at the transformation under minus one to the F, which is just a constant gauge transformation by minus one, rather than the point of view where you have this uh, gauge transformation by U of X in a non-trivial homotopy class, because it's much less clear to see what's going on from that perspective. I see, thank you. So the fact that pi four of U2 was Z2 uh, made us initially expect there to be an anomaly here, uh, a global anomaly in, in uh, U2 by that argument. But that would be the wrong conclusion. Yeah. Okay, so uh, method three um, is the, the maths way, if you like. So this is using the ideas we introduced before, uh, in particular the APS index theorem. Um, so uh, we saw earlier this was a starting point because omega-5 spin of BU2 is zero. What that means, uh, this basically allows us to compute the eta invariant directly, uh, which computes anomalous phases upon going around, say, a mapping torus, because we can just use the APS index theorem. Um, so because every closed five-manifold X is the boundary of a six-manifold Y with the relevant structures extended. So for every... Quick question. So yeah. four of u2 equals to z2, as you mentioned, is this just instant number mod two? Pi four? Yeah, so pi four of uh, u2 equals to z2, as you mentioned, right? But is this uh, z2 just instant number mod two? And then you um, can still use it to explain somehow there is no anomaly. Okay, uh, how do you, sorry, could you explain how you go from, from, from there to seeing that there's no global anomaly? It's not obvious to me in that picture, but I mean, it must be true, but. Okay, so, 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 so you're saying that uh, there's no uh, currently interpretation of this using uh, homotopy groups. Mm. I'm, I'm just saying that we haven't thought about it from that perspective, um, why there's no global anomaly from the homotopy perspective. Um, there must be some way to understand it. Um, but that's not what I'll say on this slide. So this is from the borders and perspective, which I think is much clearer. So I'll carry on because I don't really have a, <laughs> much to say about that. So, um, so we can compute the eta invariant directly, which gives you this, you know, the anomalous variation of the partition function uh, using the APS index theorem. So in particular, we take X to be a mapping torus, where we know that in SU2 we would see the Witten anomaly. Um, and we consider a gauge field configuration with an instanton, a one instanton configuration through the M, the four manifold M factor. For such a configuration, uh, you can actually extend the U2 bundle to a six manifold Y. So we know from the fact that the borders and group vanishes that there is some six manifold uh, Y with U2 bundle extended whose boundary is this. But in fact, you can take Y to be M times a disc, uh, where essentially you use the U1 factor in U2 um, the flux of that will thread through this disk. Um, essentially, if the disk, you consider, rather than a disk, consider a, a hemisphere uh, with a Dirac monopole at the middle, uh, and that's the U1, uh, an appropriate U1 gauge field to take, such that the U2 bundle extends to this. Anyway, that's the technical aside. Um, but for such a, a configuration, we can evaluate the eta invariant. Uh, so it's exponential, it's just equal to the exponential of the integral of the anomaly polynomial over that six manifold because the index is an integer. Um, and this is just a computation. So given the time, I'll just, uh, we go dot, 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 and we get the answer. Um, but it's similar computations to before, so slightly different, because we now have this six manifold. The point is, uh, the eta invariant uh, computes for us the anomalous, uh, variate the potentially anomalous variation of the partition function upon going around uh, this mapping torus. And we find exactly the same factor so again, unless uh, the familiar condition 
uh, is satisfied, the partition function will flip the sign around going around this mapping torus. And we know that this is a local anomaly, not a global one, because it was captured by the anomaly polynomial, um, gave us this formula. So another way of saying that was you didn't really need to go all the way around the mapping torus to see that there was an anomaly here. <coughs> you could just do an infinitesimal gauge transformation. Okay, um, so if I have time to discuss the last section, I know I've been talking for just over an hour, should I continue? Uh, yes, okay. we have another yeah. two Twenty-five minutes. So okay, I won't be anywhere anywhere near that long. Um, so now, in the final part of the talk, we'll consider um, a U two gauge theory defined without a spin structure. So now we're kind of, uh, as I said, detaching ourselves from our standard model motivation, and this is just uh, we're considering this theory uh, just to study the anomalies. So um, in a similarly defined S U two gauge theory. Um, there's something called the new SU2 anomaly, um, which was presented in this paper by Juven uh, and Ed Witten and Wen. Uh, so what happens to this new SU2 anomaly when you pass to U2? So again, I need to recap what the new SU2 anomaly is because it's quite different to the uh, old one. Um, so uh, the setup will be to consider an SU2 gauge theory without a spin structure to define fermions. Um, and this will mean, incidentally, that we can define the theory on non-spin manifolds, so in fact on any orientable four manifold, including, say, CP2, which doesn't admit a spin structure. So you could define a theory on, on, any, on CP2 just using, say, a spin C structure, but to see this anomaly, you have to, in particular, say that you have a spin SU2 structure, not a spin C structure. So a spin SU2 structure, what does that mean? Um, it just means that uh, the transition functions that you need when you parallel transport fermions uh, around your manifold uh, aren't valued in spin 4, they're valued in a particular group called spin S sub SU2 4, which is defined in this way. So it's spin 4 times SU2 quotiented by Z2, uh, where the Z2 corresponds to minus 1 to the F in spin 4, and uh, the central element minus 1 in SU2. Now, if you were to use such a spin SU2 structure, uh, you can only do so if all of your fields transform in representations of this group. And um, that in turn means that all fermions have to have half integral isospin under SU2 and all bosons have to have integer isospin. So then uh, we'll choose a specific spin SU2 connection. Uh, A equals, so it's proportional to sigma three in SU2 with a and minus a, where little a is a spin C connection. So this is a bit like a U1 gauge field, uh, but it doesn't obey the same quantization condition. In particular, it obeys this um, modified quantization condition. So we suppose that this spin C connection is normalized such that the integral of dA over two pi over some two manifold in CP2, which is itself a uh, CP1 subspace, is a half. So these technical details aren't especially important, but they have to be said. Um, okay, so this uh, new SU2 anomaly doesn't uh, occur on spin manifolds. Uh, it can't be seen there. It can only be seen on certain non-spin manifolds. And for sake of argument, we can take M to be CP2 to see the anomaly. And ZI will just denote uh, complex homogeneous coordinates on CP2. So CP2 is complex projective space. Um, of complex dimension two. Uh, so the anomaly is not just in a gauge transformation, uh, which it was for the old SU2 anomaly, but rather it's in the combination of a diffeomorphism. So phi is a diffeomorphism, which just sends the complex coordinates to their complex conjugates with an SU2 gauge transformation W by say, we can take it to be this particular element in SU2. And this is chosen such that the combination called phi hat leaves uh, the spin SU2 connection, uh, which we called A, capital A in the previous slide, invariant. So you can see that because basically the diffeomorphism flips the orientation of these CP1 subspaces, uh, which is basically equivalent to flipping the sign of the spin C connection A. But then the gauge transformation by W uh, interchanges these two components. Uh, so A flips back to itself, big A flips back to itself. 
So um, the idea will be that for certain fermion content, this transformation will be anomalous, uh, i.e. it won't leave the partition function invariant. So to see that, uh, a similar argument is used as for the, uh, the other with the other SU2 anomaly. So we can compute the number of zero modes uh, and we get this expression, which is again just some, um, this is for a single fermion with isospin j. So one over 24 times four j squared minus one times two j plus one just some function of j, which is always an integer. <clears throat> uh, and moreover, uh, it's shown that the fermion zero modes actually come in pairs with eigenvalues plus one and minus one under this transformation phi hat. So therefore, upon doing phi hat, uh, the partition function changes uh, by minus one to the number of zero modes divided by two, because we have a factor of minus one for each pair. So that's the factor of two. So um, again, we want to see what this factor is uh, for certain j and whether there's potentially an anomalous uh, ch change by minus one here in the partition function phase. So it turns out that this index j is actually even for every half integer j. Uh, recall all fermions have to be have half integer j. But in fact, the, this, this number is congruent to two mod four, only for representations j being four r plus three halves. So because we divide by two, only these uh, representations can possibly contribute to this anomaly. So for all other half integer values of J, uh, this expression here is a multiple of four, uh, right? But for, for these values of J, it's, it's a multiple of two. So it's not a multiple of four. Uh, so the anomaly will cancel if and only if there's an even number of fermions with these isospins. So this is the new SU2 anomaly. So now we do a similar thing in U2. So we define fields with a spin U2 structure, which is defined analogously. Uh, this in turn uh, gives a constraint on representations. So this is what means that the standard model content can't have this structure. So all fermions have to have now half integer spin and odd uh, U1 charges. And all bosons have to have integer isospin and even u1 charges so if you like this is a spin isospin charge relation uh, if you were to use the that terminology and uh, we'll consider a spin u2 connection uh, which was exactly the same as the spin su2 connection considered before uh, where a is again in the sigma 3 direction and little a is the same spin c structure uh, when we consider uh, the theory defined on cp2 So unlike uh, what we saw in U2 for the old SU2 anomaly, this anomalous transformation phi hat, basically because it involves that diffeomorphism, it can't actually be written as a pure gauge transformation, certainly not as a local gauge transformation, even in U2. So the addition of this uh, U1 uh, phase degree of freedom, which is coupled through the quotient to SU2, isn't enough to allow us to write this transformation as a local gauge transformation. But what we find, however, is a coincidence, which is that there is a gauge transformation by a phase now of pi by two in U2, which has exactly the same effect on the partition function as uh, phi hat, this anomalous transformation. So obviously this gauge transformation is an element of U2, which is strictly not in SU2. So uh, this slide is just the computation, so we can work out how the partition function varies under this just U1 local gauge transformation. We have two contributions. Now the gravitational contribution, which is of this form is non-vanishing because uh, we're on CP2. So this was the thing that vanished on S4 before. But you can compute all of these, these two terms in terms of the signature of the manifold sigma, uh, which is just one on CP2. So under this gauge transformation, the partition function changes by this phase. Um, and if you sub in the expression from way back for T of J into this formula and rearrange, you get precisely uh, what I called MathFrac capital J, J. So this index um, that was computed here from the Atiyah Singer index theorem. Okay, so under this gauge transformation by pi by two, the partition function changes in exactly the same way as we've seen uh, for this uh, combined diffeomorphism and gauge transformation in SU2. So you get precisely the same conditions for cancelling the anomaly. So you can see this in a more mundane way, basically, because uh, that condition on 
the 4R plus 3 half representations for the new anomaly to vanish actually follows um, from the local anomaly cancellations. Now it's necessarily a combination of the mixed one and the gravitational one, uh, which kind of makes some sense because uh, phi hat involved a diffeomorphism. So if you take this particular combination of the local anomaly coefficients, uh, you get something which involves this index. And if you reduce this equation mod four, uh, you get back the same condition. So in other words, the new U2 anomaly uh, can't arise, but it happens by a sort of coincidence. Um, just the local anomaly equations force you to have the same constraint on your spectrum. So it looks like you can't see this new global anomaly. And me calling this a coincidence, um, this kind of interpretation can be understood a bit better uh, using cobordism, which will be the final thing I'll discuss. So cobordism and the new U2 anomaly. So firstly for SU2 with spin SU2 structure, um, both the old and the new anomalies can be seen by the bordism computation from uh, the original paper by Wang, Wen and Witten. So you get two Z2s uh, when you compute omega-5, which says there might be two global anomalies. And indeed a possible basis uh, for the equivalent cobordism it's given by I half and I three halves, where this just denotes the, the 5D mod two indices for a fermion with either isospin half or isospin three halves. So um, this tells you if I have a single isospin half or a single isospin three halves, I'll get one of these two anomalies in the SU2 version. What about in the U2 version? Um, so Nakarin and I computed uh, the, the relevant bordism group, omega-5 of spin cross SU2 over Z2. Uh, in this case, you have to use the Adam sequence and we find a single Z2. So um, how do we interpret this result? So there's no Z2 factor uh, for the old uh, U2 anomaly corresponding to I half. So that's now gone uh, by the arguments we saw previously, which is that that, that uh, anomaly was traded for a local anomaly in U2. But interestingly, the right-hand side isn't zero. So even though we saw the new anomaly was somehow trivialized um, by a perturbative anomaly cancellation, in a sense, it's still there, at least at the level of the cobordism calculation. Um, and indeed, it's possible uh, to kind of disentangle what's going on here uh, and understand that the new U2 global anomaly could actually still be there um, from a physics perspective. Uh, so this is, in fact, very recent calculation from the last uh, two or three days uh, from myself and Nakarin. Um, so this is less concrete. But the idea being, um, at the level of the low energy theory, it's possible to cancel the perturbative anomalies in the U2 theory defined with spin U2 structure by coupling to West Amino terms uh, in, in the level of the effective field theory. So terms of this kind, uh, where phi is some pseudoscalar, dimensionless pseudoscalar, which shifts under the U1 uh, factor of U2. And if I have precisely the anomaly coefficients, A mix and A grav, uh, in front of my West Amino terms, then the total Lagrangian here is invariant under all local gauge transformations. So in other words, you add the West Amino terms to cancel only the local anomalies. And then in fact, you can check how these West Amino terms vary under phi hat, the combined diffeomorphism and gauge transformation, and you find that they don't vary. So in other words, uh, if you add these West Amino terms to cancel the local anomalies, you somehow reveal that this global anomaly can still be there. Uh, however, this is only achieved at the expense of spontaneously breaking U2 to SU2. Um, and then there's a final note, which is that this new SU2 or U2 anomaly uh, that remains could uh, interestingly then be coupled be cancelled, sorry, by coupling to a topological quantum field theory um, in the infrared, which is not the case for the old SU2 anomaly. Okay, so um, I rush slightly towards the end, uh, but here's a summary. Um, so uh, yeah, thank you very much for listening. Do we have any more questions? You have a lot more time, so 10 minutes. You can, as long as that you skip, still can go through. Okay, so this is very, this is kind of, um, in case the last few things I said were quite confusing, we could summarize uh, the story with this new U2 anomaly, uh, if you like, in the following way. 
um, which is that it is uh, in fact possible to write down a consistent U2 theory of say a single isospin three halves uh, defined using our spin U2 structure um, if you include two things. So firstly, the Wessomino terms to cancel the perturbative anomalies. And secondly, you couple to topological degrees of freedom to cancel the residual global anomaly, which is analogous to uh, the new SU2 anomaly. Okay, so then that was just the summary. Is it possible to understand the, the, the TQFT that fixes the, the W2, W3 anomaly as occurring from some Higgs phase of some other degrees of freedom? Um, I have I have no idea. Uh, that sounds like a very interesting I just say question. that because because the TQFT that we studied can be obtained from just ordinary U1 electrodynamics with a, with a fermionic monopole and a, and a fermionic charge. Oh, okay. And then you well, then in that case, yes, because ultimately uh, this is exactly the same physics as the new SU2 anomaly in this case. Um, so you just need some top of, some TQFT whose anomaly theory is given by the same thing that you had to cancel the that could give rise to the new SU2 anomaly. In other words, the product of um, the cut product of W2 and W3, the Stiefel Whitney classes on five manifold. Yeah, I'm just asking if maybe this Higgs picture gives you a natural place for this TQFT to come from. Okay, that sounds that sounds like it does. I'd have to read your paper, um, that section of your paper. I, I had a question about uh, the ambiguity of the gauge group uh, that was asked earlier. Um, so uh, I want to make sure I understand. So if we found a, a let's say a scalar particle with hypercharge one sixth of the right handed electron and no SU3 and SU2 charges, would that not resolve uh, this ambiguity in the standard model gauge group? Um, so sorry, you said. But it's uh, what exactly did you say? Heavy scalar with hypercharge one sixth, but no, yeah. no SU3, SU2 charges. Um, Yeah, I think that would that would be the case, right? Right. So, yeah, it's, it so, seems like so there are observables and colliders that, in principle, you could you could, if you're lucky enough, you could find that would maybe tell you what the gauge group is, at least within these ambiguities. Yeah. So it, it amounts to yeah, still discovering new particles whose charges or whose representations only fit inside one or you know some some subset of these gauge groups. But I think the particular case you mentioned is, yeah, that would, that would restrict you just to SU3 times SU2 times U1 with no quotient. So yeah, that's an important point is that if you had scalars, then their representations also constrain uh, G, right? It doesn't have to be fermions. This is just a representation theory argument. Thanks. I have a comment to maybe Ryan question. I'm not sure whether that's the answer you want, but uh, the way to look at the, this, uh, the new SU2 anomaly, on one side, if you consider SU2 gauge theory with the fermion in this uh, 4R plus, sorry, this uh, isospin three half representations, you can think this as a UV completion of the U1 or fermion electrodynamics because SU2 is synthetic free at high energy and equal at the low energy flow to the U1 gauge theory you mentioned, or from the two dynamics, and you can further extend this to a Z2 gauge theory. Is that, mm. the, that what, you, what you want to say? What do you want to ask, right? That, that's Thanks. basically, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. There's an RG flow picture from this SU2 at a high energy, synthetic free, and you'll be complete, and you flow to a U1 or from the two dynamics, and you can further extend to the Z2. I think it's EF, MF in the condensed matter notations. So in this in this setup, then the uh, like the Tuft monopole will be a fermion, right? Is that right. Yes. Yeah, the two line will be MF. So, okay. can you see again? Well, I'm just saying the archi flow picture from the deep UV. You can start from this uh, SU two gauge theory that define. Uh, 
down spin manifold and with this uh, fermion in isospin three half. But right now SU2 is gauged. And I say this can be a UV gauge theory and at the flow, one plate of this dynamics at IR could be some U1 gauge theory of all fermion electron dynamics where EM and F are all fermions. Make it more, more or less fermionic. And then you could also consider a further IR fact. It could be Higgs down to a Z2 gauge theory, but uh, what uh, uh, Ryan was asking. That's it. I think mm -hmm. it's discussed in our paper in New York. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I think I'm slightly confused about um, this new anomaly for U2. Are you saying that if there is this anomaly, the theory is inconsistent? Or should I interpret this as some kind of gravitational norm? So, originally... It's a global gravitational anomaly, yeah. Well, but the original point was that um, if you have a U2 theory defined with this spin U2 structure, uh, then you can't, you can't uh, just have a spin 3 halves fermion just because there's a local anomaly. So you, you break U2 gauge invariance under this U2 gauge transformation, the partition function uh, changes sign. So uh, at least in that original version, um, then certainly the, the condition that you have to have an even number of isospin 4R plus 3 half representations, fermions, um, that's a condition just on U2 gauge invariance. There's a local anomaly otherwise. So, but, but this was a sort of coincidence, uh, was the kind of interpretation. And the reason I say it's a coincidence partly is because the Borderson group seems to suggest that there is still possibly this global anomaly there. Uh, and you can identify the generator of this Z2 with the same thing uh, for the new SU2 anomaly. In other words, this W2, W3. Does that make sense? I don't know if that added. Any more questions from audience? Feel free. Uh, I have a question. Yeah, please. So this uh, this U two structure shows up naturally uh, in theories with anchor two supersymmetry. Okay. And indeed, in those cases, people uh, have studied putting the anchor two, you know, either superconformal or just supersymmetric gauge theories on CP two. So would this be would this be like as an R, R symmetry or? Yeah, so you think about the U2 as the SU2R times the U1R symmetry. Yeah. And then you can do anomaly matching by going to various phases of this gauge theory, which includes the Coulomb branch phase or the Higgs branch phases, where the SU2 and the U1R can be spontaneously broken. I think this may be related to the observation that you had, where it relates the U2 anomaly to the SU2 anomaly. They're all regarded as two to hold type an anomaly here. Okay, because the the SU the U two here is a global symmetry, not a gauge symmetry. That's right. It's part of our symmetry. Yes. Yeah. Okay, that's a, a direction to explore. Thank you. Actually, uh, maybe for discussion, I'm not sure. I, uh, but well, this is a very nice talk. I enjoy it and it's a beautiful talk. So uh, <laughs> one thing I was wondering in the literature is it looks like uh, people sometimes refer to a work by uh, Dan Free about pi on the cohomology, I think. And uh, I think uh, people said that uh, the uh, standard model without global anomaly may be check in a certain case in his paper, right? I think that one is actually just for SU5. Yeah. Like spin times SU5 and cobaltism. Maybe in some, some more earlier kind of uh, formulations, but uh, in our current yeah. world, in times SU5. I was wondering, say that, uh, uh, suppose I have the, yeah, I think I have some answer for you, but I would like to see how audience think about this. Suppose I have some uh, group G, and maybe with some uh, space time manifold structure. And let's call the whole thing as some G structure, including internal. 
and space-time symmetry. Yeah. Well, well the, 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 the statement that people say that uh, one can check the global anomaly in, in the standard model, uh, in certain case, uh, what is that? Uh, we may embed this to some, embed this standard model group to a larger one. Yeah. Right? Suppose that one we can check is all anomaly free in the larger one. Then we say, oh, the smaller one should also be anomaly free. Mm. But I feel like this statement may not be so careful. Uh, in a sense, you know, the, the quotients, let's say if uh, the original G structure is larger and then, and then we check the small, uh, we check a larger one, say called uh, uh, G tilde, let's say. Yeah. And G tilde uh, include G. But I think that uh, it could be that even G tilde could be uh, no non-trivial uh, element in the cobordism or bordism group, but uh, yeah. there is some term non-trivial in G. While the cancellations might occur such that the G and the quotient space of G tilde G might have some non trivial cancellations. And uh, so I feel like um, I'm not sure whether I fully appreciate or understand the statement to check the anomaly in the larger, larger. So, and also, yeah, once, I mean, uh, there's also the uh, a question about the contents of the meta field, the representations of fermions. Right. Those things might matter depends on whether I can hide the um, matters at a high energy, maybe not seen in the G, but perhaps there are something in the G tilde. So Yeah, I mean, I think that's precisely the answer to, the, the second thing you said is related to the answer to the first thing. So this argument that there's no uh, global anomalies in a theory with say some smaller symmetry group because there were no anomalies in the bigger ones, say SU5, that's only working because you have representations of the smaller group, you've noticed that they happen to fit inside the representations of the bigger group, in this case, SU5. So as a, phenom as a phenomenologist, uh, the reason why that's not a great, a very convincing answer is because um, in case you discover additional states which don't fit inside gut representations, then you no longer know if the standard model is anomaly free in, in the sense of global anomalies. Um, but that's, yeah, everything you said, I, I think, makes sense from the, from the fact that um, if you consider a theory with fixed matter content uh, in representations which can be embedded in bigger and bigger groups, then you can just check the biggest group. Um, but as soon as you go down to smaller groups and you allow um, more representations, then you no longer know what the global anomaly conditions are if you're allowing additional representations of the smaller subgroup, which aren't representations of the bigger group. You have to do the calculation again. Right. So that, 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 goes, that goes for SU5 down to the standard model, but it also goes for standard model then going down to the discrete quotients, right? Okay. More question from the audience. Well, if not, well, if you want, you can unmute yourself and then give a uh, uh, Joe a very nice uh, applause. Applause. Thank you very much. Joe. Thank you. Thank you. Dave. Thank you very much for listening.